Ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Robertson, and as you've probably guessed from the title of this video, today I will be talking about missile-based weaponry, in particular guided missiles, and how they relate to space-based warfare in science fiction. Along with their pros and cons compared to direct fire weapons like the ones that were discussed in depth in my previous videos. Now, before we begin, regarding my earlier videos, I did receive a few comments from a couple of obvious neckbeards who basically ridiculed the whole idea that we'd ever use energy or projectile based weaponry in space, and they argue that all engagements would either become missile fests or games of cat and mouse with spacecraft being more like stealthy submarines in space rather than warships. Now, while they're not entirely wrong, sadly they're not quite right either, and have fallen prey to some of the common misconceptions about space and space warfare. First off, yes, spacecraft in the near to mid future will indeed bear more of a resemblance to submarines rather than surface warships, but only in the way that the interior is designed, with little to no windows, a CIC instead of the bridges that we see in movies these days, and everything will be laid out as efficiently as possible, with very little in the way of wasted space. You see, apart from the other vessels shooting at you, the main threat in space comes from being exposed to a vacuum and harmful radiation, and unlike with a submarine, pressure isn't too much of an issue, as instead of being 200 metres below the surface of the ocean and having to deal with up to 20 Earth atmospheres crushing down on you, in space, it's more like going from 1 to 0 atmospheres, which is extremely tame by comparison. Yeah, not quite the way that it's been portrayed by Hollywood so far, where even a tiny hole in the surface of the hero's spaceship causes something of a miniature hurricane to occur, with everyone and everything inside being pulled towards it. In reality, it's a lot less dramatic than that, but it is still dangerous nonetheless. Trying to stay hidden, however, is the big problem though, as has already been discussed on the Project Row website, thanks to the second law of thermodynamics, stealth in space is so insanely difficult to achieve that to even do so with any amount of reasonable success would result in a vessel that lacks any real ability to fight or have enough delta V to be able to change course or maneuver once it does get detected. And when it comes to being detected in space, it's more of a case of when, not if. Secondly, if you're relying entirely on missiles, then you're essentially putting all your trust on the ability of said missiles to be able to overwhelm your opponent's point defence systems, and do enough damage to mission kill the enemy vessels before you yourself run out of ammunition. And let's face it, if you're going up against a laser star or kineta star, then there's a very good chance that they're going to be able to keep on shooting for a lot longer than you can. However, the neckbeards aren't alone in their way of thinking, as there is indeed a prevailing hypothesis that missiles will soon be the only relevant weapon in the battle space, and given the current trends in modern warfare at the moment, it's not too difficult to see why as both anti-tank and anti-ship guided missiles are dominating today's battlefield, so it's easy to see how people may believe that this could continue to be the case when it comes to combat between various spacecraft in the near future. The thing is though, it's not quite as simple as that. The reason why is because even current point defence systems in use today, also referred to as CIWS or CWIS, have already started to shift the balance away from missile attacks. And it's not just the rapid AI controlled small calibre Gatling guns we're seeing, we're also starting to see increasingly more cost effective smaller high speed interceptor missiles and even chemical laser based anti-missile defences coming into service and those don't even need to lead their target or deal with bullet spread. In fact, even despite the appearance of hypersonic missiles, it's been suggested that the development of point defence systems may eventually bring naval warfare full circle, with an emphasis on some warships also being fitted with direct fire cannons again, only this time they'll be using hypervelocity projectiles instead. This tug of war between guided missiles and direct fire weaponry is likely to continue for the foreseeable future and is more than likely going to be something that we'll see when it comes to how spacecraft will be armed in the next 100 to 200 years. 
Indeed, many sci-fi books, comics, television shows and games quite often have spacecraft that are armed with both of these weapon systems, which is one of the few things that I strongly suspect they actually got right. So what are the advantages of guided missiles in space warfare? Now, we're talking about bona fide guided missiles here, not the space engineers version which are little more than short range dumpfire rockets that explode after a measly 800 meters. So the first advantage is that they are essentially small drone spacecraft that will chase enemy vessels in order to attack them, either through the use of a high yield warhead or the transfer of kinetic energy, i.e. collide with it. One of the biggest advantages of missiles over direct energy weapons is that missiles do not generate massive amounts of waste heat on the vessel that fires them. A missile can be pushed off with a smaller thruster, cold gas or even springs. And once clear of the firing vessel, the missile's own propulsion system ignites. After that, all the waste heat that's been generated by the missile is now the missile's problem and not the firing ships. Another thing to remember is that most guided missiles will, in essence, be fire and forget weapons, which means that after firing them, you are free to do whatever you like, which includes changing course and putting as much distance between yourself and your opponent as possible, and, if the verse allows it, even use your jump drive or hyperspace engine to leave the area or star system completely. Safe in the knowledge that your missile is going to continue to be an ever-growing concern for your opponent with each passing second, providing of course that they themselves aren't able to use their own jump drives and escape to safety also. Another point worth mentioning is that compared to particle beams and laser weapons, missiles are not subject to the inverse square law, and they certainly don't suffer from any form of diffraction. As I mentioned in an earlier video, both particle and laser beams grow weaker with distance, but that nuclear warhead on the tip of that missile has exactly the same strength, no matter how far it travels. The only downside regarding nuclear weapons, which is often overlooked in science fiction, is that even those in the megaton range, while they do extreme amounts of damage in an atmosphere, in space, they will ideally need to detonate within a kilometre of the enemy vessel in order to be able to inflict any serious damage. And in space, a kilometre is considered to be pretty close range. The reason for this is because without an atmosphere, there is no explosive shockwave, so the amount of damage they cause drops off very rapidly with range. Rather than an almighty boom, shockwave and a mushroom cloud, in space, a nuclear explosion just looks like a blindingly bright light bulb that flashes on for a fraction of a second before it disappears again. If it goes off within a kilometre of its intended target, and it's close enough to cause impulsive shock damage, what you will probably see is hot gas boiling off from its surface. This will, in most cases, be instantaneous and easy to miss. What you won't miss, however, is the spallation and thermal damage caused by the nuclear explosion, as the side nearest the detonation will be glowing either white, yellow, orange or red, depending on the metal it's made from, and pieces of the vessel will be torn off both sides, as the impulsive shock wave travels through the skin of the target. Suffice to say that any tanks and even sections of the ship that contain any pressurised gases inside are likely to rupture at this point and begin leaking out into space. However, a direct hit with a nuclear warhead will most likely vaporise the vessel where it strikes and, depending on its size, send what's ever left of its outer edges flying off into the void, along with pretty much all the same effects I've just mentioned. Now, I'm just using nuclear warheads as an example here, but as hinted at earlier, it's also possible that the missile may be a kinetic kill weapon, in which case, either the whole missile, or more likely, it'll be a bus, carrying multiple metal cylinders that pop out and spread as the missile reaches its terminal stage. These are affectionately known as SCODs, or soda cans of death, due to their proposed shape and size. Now, I know some of you are probably laughing and thinking, come on Captain, don't be silly. If you throw a bunch of things the shape and size of a can of Coca-Cola at a spaceship, it'll just bounce off and everyone will laugh at you. Well, they would, if you were still on planet Earth, 
And even if it was fired out of a cannon at just over a kilometre and a half per second, it might just be enough to penetrate the armour on a main battle tank. Hey, at the very least, it'd make one hell of an impressive dent. But we're talking about space. More importantly, we're talking about something that's just been popped out of a missile that, for the most part, was launched quite early on in the engagement and has been constantly accelerating towards its intended target for quite some time and is now closing in at well over 10 kilometers per second by the time those squads hit. So, let's do some calculating, shall we? Each of those soda cans of death has a mass of about 1 kilogram. Now, I'm being very conservative here because if they're made of something like depleted uranium or tungsten, they could be almost twice that. So that's 1 kilogram going at around 10 kilometers per second, which means that each of those little submunitions are packing a whopping 50 megajoules of energy. To give you guys and gals a rough comparison, that's five times the energy of a round that's been fired out of an M1 Abrams or Leopard 2's 120mm main cannon, or the equivalent of 12 kilograms of TNT. Those damn things have built up enough energy that they will more than likely explode into a ball of hot plasma upon impact with the target. And that's just one of them. Could you imagine if each missile carries about 20 to 30 of them? Even if you got lucky and only about 5 to 10 of them hit your vessel, the damage would be catastrophic. For all intents and purposes, it would be like being hit by the same number of railgun rounds all at once. This is also likely to happen, albeit to a slightly lesser degree, if the missile is destroyed by a point defence weapon as it starts its terminal stage. When this happens, the fragments of the missile are usually still going fast enough and retain enough of their initial energy that they are still able to cause significant damage when they hit the target vessel. Strangely enough, I have yet to see this simulated in any sci-fi game so far. In almost all cases, the missiles usually just vanish in an impressive yet harmless puff of smoke whenever they're destroyed. Conventional high-explosive warheads would most likely not be a thing in missiles that are used in space warfare, like in the case with railgun and mass driver rounds, and for very much the same reasons, the velocities involved are so great that they will do much more damage from the kinetic energy of their impact than from any kind of explosives that you are likely to be able to stick on them, barring nuclear warheads of course, but I've already covered those earlier. Regarding using EMP warheads on missiles, or indeed most EMP-based weaponry in general and their usefulness in space warfare, sadly, despite being a strong sci-fi trope, not only do they have a very limited range in a vacuum, but the esteemed Byron Coffey also talked about them briefly back in 2016, where he says that there are a number of natural effects encountered in spaceflight that are similar to EMPs. Solar storms in particular can produce induced currents in much the same manner, requiring spacecraft to be hardened against them. This hardening would also be effective against EMPs, requiring massive amounts of power to have any chance of working. The only really practical use for EMP weapons might be during hostile boarding missions against civilian or disabled warships. In essence, most space-going vessels are shielded against that type of damage, even the rockets and capsules currently used today. So therefore, it's probably very safe to assume that combat spacecraft in the near to mid-future will be even more protected against an EMP attack, making them much less likely in a warfare scenario. What I will say is that one of the biggest advantages of guided missiles is that from the moment they are launched, they present a continuous and ongoing threat to their target, more so if there's been multiple missiles fired at it. Combined with the stress of combat in general, and it's very possible that many inexperienced, careless or distracted commanders may struggle to keep their focus, and it's not beyond the realm of possibility that they may lose track of the incoming missiles. In fact, a good example of this would be from one of our own gaming sessions that was held just before Christmas last year. A colleague of mine wanted to test out his hypothesis that his spacecraft, which started out its life as a defence installation but he'd since turned it into what essentially could be considered a heavy cruiser, and had the majority of its armour and weaponry on one side, 
stating that it could easily defeat the more well-rounded Theseus Star Cruiser, even with its guided missiles. As my opponent's vessel had its weapons and armour concentrated on one side, it kept turning that particular side to face the Star Cruiser at every opportunity. You could see that they were just waiting for the Star Cruiser to get within range so they could unleash their impressive barrage of firepower upon it. So, I changed the script on the Star Cruiser's player-made guided missiles to manoeuvre and begin heading towards the target after a delay of 30 seconds instead of the normal two that's used to ensure they clear the launch tubes. I then proceeded to fire four of them, just past where I knew the limits of its PDC weapon range was so they'd fly past and behind it. My opponent noticed this of course and gave a few snide comments about how my missiles had failed spectacularly. Then, as expected, after 30 seconds, every single one of them locked onto the enemy ship, turned around and began accelerating back towards it, heading straight towards its least protected side. Whilst this was going on, I started to accelerate my own star cruiser closer to the enemy vessel just to try and distract them as much as possible. And it must have worked because by the time my opponent had realised what was going on and their limited PDC coverage on that side of the vessel had began to open fire, it was already too late. Unfortunately, one of the missiles was taken out by the PDC fire before it could hit, but the other three managed to get through and they found their mark, taking out the enemy ship's two reactors and most of its batteries, which basically turned them into a sitting duck. This is just one example of how guided missiles can be used to great effect, but there's others out there. In fact, there's some missiles in use, even today, that use a shape-charged warhead to attack down onto the weaker parts of the target's armour as the missile flies over the top. So it's entirely possible that in the future, they could have a weapon like a Kasaba howitzer built into them in order to achieve something similar. Now that we're familiar with the pros of using guided missiles, let's talk about some of the cons. First off, as previously mentioned in this video, they are all vulnerable to incoming fire, particularly from small, rapid-fire point defence weapons, also known as close-in weapon systems, or CWIS. How effective these are are still very much open to debate and will depend on a variety of factors, such as what type of point defence weapons are being used, how many they have, the effectiveness of their fire control systems, sensors, and how many missiles have been fired at the vessel. But it's not just direct weapons fire that can take out an incoming missile, they can also be shot down by other missiles, and they don't have to be that expensive to do so. All you need are just some cheap and cheerful short-ranged missiles of your own, with tiny warheads that are only intended to take out other missiles. We see something like this today with the Patriot and Iron Dome defence systems. Alternatively, you can go for an even more cost-effective solution and just use something that was proposed by Kirk Spencer, which is to use a series of small drones that only have a mediocre ability to manoeuvre. The sole purpose of these drones is to be launched away from the vessel that's being tracked and place themselves squarely in the path of the incoming missiles. This is done well in advance and uses the missile's own closing rate against it, hopefully well before it's had the chance to enter its terminal phase and deploy the dreaded soda cans of doom I talked about earlier. As you can imagine, these Kirkland mines, as they're affectionately known, are an extremely cost-effective method of dealing with guided missiles, which, in many cases, will most likely be far more expensive to produce, take up much more space, and most importantly, cost more in the way of mass on the firing vessel. As fate would have it, we already have something very similar today, with both Raytheon and Lockheed Martin currently developing exo-atmospheric kill vehicles designed to neutralise nuclear missiles while they're still in orbit, so creating something to work in the vacuum of space that doesn't require a separate launch vehicle would be fairly simple by comparison. As I've just mentioned, another issue with using guided missiles is their cost, both financially and in terms of mass for the firing vessel. Guided missiles, whether they're short-ranged interceptors or long-range torch missiles and autonomous kill vehicles, also known as ATKs, or torpedoes if you're a trope-loving sci-fi nerd that likes to use wet navy terminology, 
the issue still remains that they're going to be a lot more expensive to manufacture and weigh a lot more than the ammo required by direct fire weaponry, especially if they're being fitted with additional armour, sensor shielding and redundancies to try and protect them against enemy point defences. Even if you're just opting to carry more missiles in an attempt to overwhelm the defences instead, at the end of the day it's going to be costly. Eventually, it'll reach a stage where there will be an optimal cost that militaries will be willing to spend on each type of missile. And once they get to the stage where they are almost as expensive as the vessels or defence platforms that fire them, then they will become more of an economic liability, especially if it's very likely that they'll be intercepted and destroyed by one of the many methods I've mentioned previously. Another thing I'd like to mention is that despite popular belief, an enemy vessel that tries to use some form of decoy or countermeasure, as well as trying to manoeuvre to somehow evade the missile, isn't really feasible in the near to mid future, especially with regards to space warfare. It makes sense to assume that the missiles being used will, by their very nature, have more delta V than the target vessels they are being used against, and will only be launched when the target vessel is within range and there's an excellent probability to hit, otherwise it would just be a waste to fire them. And there's a very strong possibility that the computer will warn the weapons officer about this well before he pulls the trigger. The reason why using decoys or countermeasures to try and fool the missile into going after the wrong target is likely to fail is that even today's air-to-air -air guided missiles, when fired against a target that is manoeuvring, using chaff and flares, still have a kill probability of around 90%, which if my research is correct is absolutely terrifying, as back in the Vietnam era it was nearer 18%, and that was still pretty decent. Pure infrared systems are imager based nowadays, which more or less makes them immune to countermeasures. But even now, these are being phased out and replaced with even newer multi-spectral guidance systems that are essentially unstoppable, operating on radio, visual and thermal frequencies. And the thing is, that's what we have in development now. Imagine how good they'll be in the next 25 to 100 years or more. You also have to bear in mind that spacecraft are a lot bigger, hotter and significantly less agile than fighter jets. Trying to make a decoy that fools a next generation guided missile, or the vessel that's firing it, will more than likely cost almost as much as the damn ship it's pretending to be. Which is one of the main reasons why it's highly unlikely. Now that I've covered the pros and cons of guided missiles, before closing, let's take a look at some of the most common mistakes that a lot of games, sci-fi movies and television series make regarding their portrayal of missile based weapons. Number 1. They're in space, but they still zip around like they're flying in an atmosphere, and even seem to have a top speed. Yeah, this one is quite often done in media for the coolness effect, as there's nothing more exciting than our hero or heroine trying to shake a missile from the tail of their starfighter, and it's slowly getting closer. It's not realistic, because none of them are obeying the laws of physics, but hey, that's entertainment for you. Some games do this too, but you quite often find that they're the ones that don't really use Newtonian physics, or more likely the devs are just afraid that their game will crash spectacularly if it does. Number 2. Smaller, thinner missiles are faster and more manoeuvrable than the bigger ones. Now, the thing is, in reality, if the missile is larger, or more precisely, longer and has more propellant, it'll usually have more delta V. Which means that not only would the bigger missile be able to accelerate faster, but it would also be able to burn for longer, leaving the smaller one well behind. Making the larger, more deadlier missiles slower and less manoeuvrable is quite often done for gameplay or balance reasons. Yes, I'm looking at you, Conflict Free Space and Wing Commander. It's mainly done to force the player to make a choice in the type of weapons they pick and to also force them to use the bigger, deadlier missiles on larger, slower targets, and in many cases defend said missiles as they slowly and laboriously make their way towards the enemy carrier. This seems to suggest that the mass of the larger missile consists almost entirely of its warhead, and it's using a crappy little hull effect thruster, or some other type of ion propulsion, to try and reach its target. But that wouldn't make much sense, and would probably end up losing you the war against the alien aggressors. Number 3. 
Lots of little missiles that look amazing, but do almost no damage at all. Ah yes, another common sci-fi trope quite often seen in many action-orientated space sims, and I use the term space sim loosely here. I think you'll find that no weapon supplier, or any military in their right mind, would use a weapon that does little more than scratch the paintwork of their intended target, even if they do fire about 12 of them at a time. I mean, to use a present day example, you don't use a shotgun loaded with birdshot against an enemy soldier decked out in level 4 body armour, it's just common sense. Likewise, in the future, if your guided missiles do the same or less damage than your direct fire weapons, then wouldn't you just be better off using them instead, especially given the mass and cost savings involved in the ammunition? Sadly, again, like with the previous entry, this is very much done for gameplay reasons, both to give the players more eye candy and to make the battles last longer. If the weapons used in many space sims were actually as powerful as they're likely to be in real life, then the battles would be a lot more brutal and they would be over a lot sooner than they are now. The only games or television shows that accurately portray how devastating an attack by guided missiles are likely to be in the near future are Children of a Dead Earth and The Expanse, both of which feature missiles that make use of nuclear warheads. Number 4 Deadly long-ranged missiles that fizzle out or explode after travelling a mere one kilometre. Again, this quite often appears to be a gameplay related decision. Maybe the game engine in question can't handle processing any more than a handful of guided missiles, and it certainly can't cope with having them all fly out to even modest ranges. Unfortunately, this means that you're stuck using missiles that have lost one of the main advantages that they have over direct fire weapons. This seems to be an issue that's more common with console games rather than PC, but we do still see this in games like Empyrean Galactic Survival and even in some mods for space engineers. And finally, number 5. The spacecraft with a magical bag of missiles. In other words, the spacecraft is firing more missiles, or indeed larger missiles, than it could ever possibly carry in real life. If the missiles aren't being carried on pylons, then they'll more than likely be stored in individual launch tubes or in a dedicated ammo magazine that feeds directly into the launcher itself. Either way, these things take up a great deal of space, and that needs to be reflected in how the vessel is designed. Too many lazy game devs and sci-fi movie producers hand wave this away, and instead we get spacecraft that are the science fiction equivalents of the old-fashioned Hollywood movie cowboys that can somehow fire an amazing 15 rounds out of their cult six-shooters. Exciting and entertaining, yes, but realistic and immersive, not so much. Anyway, these are just some of the more common mistakes regarding missiles that have been made in the various forms of media over the years, but I'm sure there's a lot more out there, and you're more than welcome to post them in the comment section below. In conclusion, guided missiles are an extremely valuable addition to the arsenal that any near to mid future spacecraft would deploy in the battle space. But rather than being the sole weapon type to be deployed, I fully expect them to be used alongside other types of weapon systems, with missiles being used to supplement both fixed and turreted direct fire weaponry for example. If any vessels do specialise in only one type of weapon system, then it would make sense that it's operating as part of a unit, whereby at least one of the other spacecraft is using another, thereby limiting the weaknesses involved in said specialisation. As I've said in my previous videos, for all you content creators out there, how you design your own spacecraft is entirely up to you, and will be heavily influenced by the lore, game setting, and even the mods that you're using. But I hope that these videos have given you some good ideas on how to make them a little more plausible, or at the very least believable in the universe that they're set in, and less gimmicky, and in doing so have your creations reflect something that's come from a background in science fiction that leans less towards science fantasy and more towards science fact. Once again I would like to close by thanking all of my amazing subscribers, followers and viewers out there. I wish you all the very best, and I look forward to seeing you all in the next video. This is Robertson, signing off.